know, I actually wish I had a co-founder <laughs> most days of the, of the week. Um, it, uh, I, I guess uh, I, I don't actually talk about this in my presentation, but uh, my wife, I guess, would be the closest thing to a co-founder, Charity Water. Uh, my now wife, the first person I hired was someone to help work on water projects, and the second person was, uh, would eventually become my wife uh, to help me create this brand. And then uh, I married the brand because I, I fell in love with it. So um, uh, so good to be here in, uh, in Kansas City. You know, Jeff uh, and I uh, got to know each other in Omaha. He called me out of the blue a couple years ago and said, would you come to Big Omaha? And the reason I accepted it was just because I'd never been to Omaha before. And uh, it was an incredible experience and so many unbelievable things happened uh, through uh, just through that community, through meeting people. So this time it was easier. He was like, would you come to Kansas City? I'd actually never been to Kansas City before uh, and said, absolutely. And uh, I'm so excited to be here today. As you maybe can hear in my voice, uh, I came down with this horrible bug last night, so uh, I'm going to try to just get through without coughing. I've got like, you know, arms full of sepacols and ricolas and uh, throat coat tea over there, so give me a little grace if I start hacking up a lung in the middle, but uh, I'm excited for the time we're going to spend together. Uh, let's put up the slides and say work. Do I? Oh, there we go. I have it. Okay. So. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about my story and how I, uh, I got into this crazy water work through a very non-traditional path. I'm going to talk about water and I'm going to share some photos uh, that I've taken from around the world and give you guys an insight into the water crisis and what it looks like. And then I'm going to talk about uh, charity water and what we've done over the last six years uh, to, to try to disrupt uh, the, the, the space uh, of giving and also help uh, a ton of people get clean water. So I'll start here. This was me as a kid. My parents actually used a bowl to cut a cereal bowl to cut my hair. Uh, born in a middle class family, Philadelphia. Mom was a writer. Dad was a middle class businessman. When I was four, mom gets incredibly sick as there is a carbon monoxide gas leak in our house. And just uh, her immune system is completely wiped out. She becomes an invalid. Uh, the, the carbon dioxide didn't kill her, but it did destroy her immune system. So grew up as an only child, uh, definitely a very conservative Christian family, kind of helping to take care of mom. Uh, at 18, like so many bad cliches, I rebel, move to New York City, grow my hair down to my shoulders, join a band, and I am now going to do every single thing that I was not allowed to do growing up. And I learned learned that you could, uh, well the band immediately broke up because we, we didn't really like each other, uh, but there was this guy that was booking out my band and he was making way more money than we were. He would basically take all the money, you know, throw like 50 bucks at us. I thought, wow, this is an interesting job. You can actually get paid to promote nightclubs. So basically the next 10 years just flashed by uh, and I became a nightclub promoter. And I just couldn't believe that there was, you know, that I could get paid to drink alcohol for free and that all my friends would drink for free. And you just had to get the right beautiful people in the club. And if you got the right people in the club, you could charge astronomical amounts uh, for alcohol. You could charge $16 for, you know, a, a cocktail. You could charge $500 for a bottle of champagne that cost you 40 bucks. And you could make people buy four of these things just to get inside your club. So 10 years flash uh, kind of by and you know, one by one, all the things I said I would never do as a kid, I, I did. Uh, this was a, a snapshot of my life at 28 years old. I show this photo because it just shows what an idiot I am because I am holding out the Rolex watch so that the photographer you know, is sure to photograph my expensive watch. Total idiot. Uh, it looked kind of glamorous on, on the outside in my life. Uh, I was getting paid $2,000 a month to drink Bacardi uh, in public. Budweiser paid another $2,000 a month just to drink Bud. And, uh, you know, we worked two nights a week. If you saw me about seven hours after this, uh, it was a less prettier picture. <laughs> and it was really a lifestyle of gambling, of drugs, of pornography, of strip clubs, of, of darkness, really. So after 10 years of living this darkness, I was in uh, Punta del Esta, I was in South America, and I was with all of the right people, and you know, I had a great car, and I had a great apartment, and a grand piano, and the girlfriend who was you know, on, on, in magazines, and, uh, and I was miserable. And I looked around, and I'm like, I'm gonna be 60 years old getting people drunk for a living. 
And I realized that that was, that was like my job. Like I'd, I just got people drunk for a living. That was going to be my legacy. And, you know, I, I had really walked away from all semblance of faith for 10 years. And uh, my dad had given me this like book of dense theology by this guy like A.W. Tozer. And I remember with a hangover, I start reading this during the day in South America. And it was like a wake up call. You know, I was I, like, I needed to change my life now uh, or else. So I came back to New York City and you know, I started trying to re-explore uh, faith and like, what would that look like? What would, it, what would the 180 degree opposite of my life look like? And uh, I, I started, you know, I started praying, like, what's next? I can't sell alcohol any longer. And it took me a few months of kind of floundering and trying to find my way, but I got this idea, what if I gave back one of the 10 years that I'd wasted in humanitarian service? I said, what if I went to the poorest country in the world? And, you know, Africa is very trendy now. For me, it was not trendy at all. I remember those people who used to come in our church, you know, like the missionaries with dirt under their fingernails, and they smelled, and, you know, I had no desire to, to go to Africa. But I thought um, maybe, this would, maybe this would be the, the opposite of my life. So I start applying to all these humanitarian organizations, and to my surprise, I'm denied to volunteer for them. Well, they're like, what is a nightclub promoter, you know? How, how would you be useful to our mission in Sudan? We're serious people. So thankfully, after all these deni denials come in, one organization says, if you pay us $500 a month, you can volunteer. It's like, sure, <laughs> where are you going? Uh, and they turned out to be going to a place called Liberia. So I had, uh, in the fall of 2004, I, I changed kind of everything about my life to go join this humanitarian mission uh, in West Africa. Now, I had signed up to be a volunteer photojournalist, and I'd always taken kind of okay pictures. I'd been an okay writer. You know, I wrote for the newspaper, the local newspaper when I was 16. So I put up a bunch of stuff on a blog and said, you know, I know a lot of people in New York after 10 years of nightlife. Maybe like the stories that I'm able to tell in Liberia, I can share with people and, and that'll raise awareness and maybe even money for your work. So that was the idea. I left a, a, a pretty nice apartment, um, made a 180 degree turn, gave up all my vices. So before the ship sailed in, I got wasted. I smoked uh, two and a half packs of cigarettes for the last time and really said, like, everything in my life needs to change. Like, I need to go all in and start this new journey. So I, I started living about 200 square feet down by the waterline on this ship. Amazing organization. For 25 years, doctors had just sailed this thing up and down the West African coast, uh, bringing some of the best doctors in the world to people who had no access to medical care. So I'm on a ship with 350 volunteers, and I start immediately feeling sorry for myself because there are cockroaches, and I'm sleeping in a bunk bed, and I've got two strange roommates covered in grease, and they live in the engine room and uh, work in the engine room, look like they live in the engine room. And I then get off the ship, and I start learning that wow, I should stop feeling sorry for myself right now because people are living in apartment buildings like this and houses like this. And Liberia had come out of a 14-year civil war. Charles Taylor had decimated this country. Uh, child soldiers uh, putting, you know, uh, putting guns in the hands of kids and uh, raged a 14-year war. Uh, when I sailed into Liberia, we came in with 14,000 UN peacekeeping troops, which was the largest force ever deployed by the UN anywhere in the world. And there was no public electricity, there was no running water, there was no sewage, and there was no mail. A small advance team would flyer the country and, uh, and put up these, these posters saying, hey, if you've got a huge tumor, flesh-eating disease, if you need facial reconstruction, if you've had a cleft lip or a cleft palate, turn up and maybe our doctors can help you. So I remember my third day on the mission, I was so excited. I grabbed my camera, we're rolling up to the stadium, and we are going to help people with the doctors. And I know that we have 1,500 surgery slots over an eight-month period. But there's a problem. There's 7,000 people standing outside the stadium. And it was one of the toughest moments for me, taking this picture knowing that over 5,000 people were going to be turned away just because we didn't have enough doctors. The ship wasn't big enough. Some of them had walked a month. The next couple photos are, are tough, but it's what I saw. First kid in line um, who had gotten there a couple days early uh, that we brought in at 5.30 in the morning was this boy named Alfred. And he just had a, a huge benign tumor that was choking him to death. 
So he was literally gurgling, supp suffocating to death on his own face. And I've got a photograph of him. I just lost it. I mean, I went in the corner and I started crying. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. And the head medical officer came over to me and said, dude, you signed up for this. This is what we do. You're going to see hundreds of patients, and many are going to be worse than this. But the good news is we're going to be able to help Alfred. So I pulled it together. I, I managed to get through the next couple days. And then he invited me into Alfred's surgery later that week and said, remember Alfred, watch what we're going to be able to do. And I watched as these amazing surgeons removed the tumor. And then a week later, they said, why don't you take Alfred home and see what that's like? See what it's like when a, an entire community had written someone off for dead and they get to embrace him back as alive. And it was an incredible, incredible moment. A party, hundreds of people came and I got to watch him grow up and, and heal. And this is what life was like on the ship. I'd get up, put my scrubs on, I'd go down to the ward, I would meet Martheline. Ten years this thing grew. She has a towel in her hand because people would throw rocks at her when she left her hut. They thought she was cursed. What she needed was a 40 minute surgery to get her face back and her life back. It was an extraordinary experience and I could do a day on the people that I met, the incredible doctors and surgeons coming from all over the world, giving up their vacation time to use their talent to help people. I finished a year, I signed up for a second tour in Liberia, not knowing what was next. And on that second tour, I started learning that this, the dirty water, was making some of these people sick. And thankfully for me, there was a little bit of money given to this guy off to the side to go help rural communities get clean water. It was a huge medical ship, but one guy was given, his name was Leif, he was a volunteer from Colorado. He was given some money to help in the villages. So I jumped in my Land Rover and I had to go out and document everything he was doing. And I'll never forget the first time I saw the water source that he was gonna replace. And this was uh, a town called, um, Oh gosh, it was in uh, rural Liberia. There were about 250 people here drinking from this swamp. And I remember just watching kids come, dip in their buckets, take it home. So what Leif would do is over the next couple months, we would provide mercy ships, would provide the, the PVC, the cement, the pump, the knowledge. He would train the locals on how to tap into the clean groundwater, which was 40 feet beneath that village, which was horrible irony. And then he would take me back and I could drink clean water from these wells. And the, the surgeries were obviously impactful, getting to know these patients. But here was a guy off to the side for a fraction of the cost, impacting thousands and thousands of lives with the most basic needs, something I'd never even thought of people needing. I mean, for me, water had always come out of taps. I took long showers. So I came back to New York City at 30, and I was completely changed. My heart had been broken. I mean, you just you cry for a living on that ship. And I'd seen all of these problems. I'd seen people dying of AIDS. I'd seen kids with, uh, unable to go to school. I'd seen people dying of malaria. I'd spent time in a leprosy colony. Obviously seen the surgery, seen the need for water. But I just kept coming back to this image. And it's the belief that nobody should have to drink water from a swamp. I wouldn't have walked in this water. I wouldn't let my dog drink this water. So there the idea uh, for Charity Water was born. And I'll talk a little bit more about water. That wasn't an isolated event, as I found out. So I grabbed a camera and I started learning about water and what would I do about it. I mean, I was a nightclub promoter that had just taken a bunch of pictures for a couple years. Here's the, the top level stat, which just means nothing to anyone in this room. 800 million people don't have clean water. There's no way we can conceive of a number that big. 800 million anything. But if you guys were to come with me, this is what you would see. You would see this time and time again. You'd see a kid like John Bosco in Rwanda walk into a swamp, get water, take it home. You'd see a community like this in northern Uganda share an open well with their cattle and their livestock. You would learn about the slew of diseases, some you've heard of, like cholera, some you may not have, like schistosomiasis or schistosoma, which is just a fancy word for worms, which infects 200 million people every single day.
You might have met this child with me. So she was drinking from a river in Athenai, Kenya. It was just a pipe stuck into the river, and every time she would drink, she would throw up on her shirt. And we watched this in horror, took the water away from her, promised to try to help the village. And I brought this back to New York City, and I gave it to a lab, and I said, can you guys just put this under a microscope? What is this? What's in it that's making her sick? And they made me a movie. And they said, you know, hey, we're not sure what all of the parasites and amoeba are, but we know that that water is alive. Leeches. Something I never in a million years associated with drinking water, but community after community would hold out their hands and show me the leeches in their water. And they'd say, the big ones are never a problem. We can always filter them out using cloth, using scarves, using t-shirts. But sometimes the little ones will get through. Two common ways to get a leech out of the back of the throat, which is a leech's favorite spot. One is to use a stick and to pry it, and the second is to drink diesel fuel. Enough to kill the leech and not enough to kill the host. I heard probably the roughest story last year in northern Ethiopia. I've been there 16, 17 times in the last couple of years, and I was really rural. I was uh, maybe eight hours from the city of the north. And we were at a, some like six dollar night hotel room and the hotel owner walks up to me and a few of the donors I was with and says, you're the charity water people. You guys have been doing a lot for this region. We know about you. Let me tell you the story of this woman that lived in my village before you guys started working here. And I actually don't have her photo. Um, this is a photo of, of a woman about her age from the same region. And I use this to illustrate the clay pot. Some of you guys saw those yellow jerry cans. Well, that's how most people carry their water. But Leta Koros didn't have one of those. She had a 20-pound clay pot that then weighed 50 pounds full with water. And he said she walked eight hours every single day to fetch water from a river. Three hours out, five hours back. And he said one day she came back into my village and he said she slipped and she fell, and the clay pot broke, and all the water spilled out. And he said, I'll never forget. She took the rope and she hung herself from a tree in the middle of the village. And he said, the work you're doing is important, and he walked off. The horrible irony is, is that we've now done 2,000 projects in this region, 100% vision for coverage in the next seven years. But Leta Koros had no, she had no hope. And right now people are walking every single day to get water you wouldn't think of drinking. Okay, so that's, that's the hard part. It's completely solvable. So we know how to bring clean drinking water to every single person on earth. And if you don't marry to one solution, if you're solution agnostic, we can solve the problem in its entirety. Sometimes it is a hand dug well, and that's the appropriate technology. Sometimes water is much deeper, and you can drill a well. We've done them now up to 1,200 feet deep. Sometimes you can harvest the rain. Sometimes you can tap a mountain spring and use gravity to take it down to a network and serve many villages. Sometimes you can take dirty surface water and clean it, either at a community level or at a household level. There are new interesting models. You've got an organization here, water.org, based in Kansas City, that's exploring water credit. New ways to make projects sustainable over time. Here's what this looks like. Saturday, I go to Cambodia. There, for about $65, a family can construct a bio sand filter. Take water like this, pour it through a big cement box, gravel, sand, rock. After 21 days, an inch of good bacteria grows that kills 99% of the germs. And water goes in like that and comes out like that. Water that I drink with no problems. Sometimes you can hand dig a well, and that's about five, six thousand dollars, and it's just a lot of labor. It's a few months of digging, water comes in, you need dewatering pumps so you can take the water out and keep going deeper and deeper so that as the water table rises and recedes, there's enough water in the dry season. You make concrete culverts and they form the lining of the well so they don't collapse over time. And then 15, sometimes $20,000, you can drill wells. 
depending on the topography, you bring in a million dollar drilling rig and eight skilled drillers, sometimes 200 feet, sometimes 1,000 feet, but you're tapping into massive underground aquifers, literally lakes under some of these villages. This was at a school, 2,000 kids in Tigray, Ethiopia that had never had clean water. We got so much water that we ripped off the hand pump, put in a huge solar project, and it's now water's being pumped up to reservoirs, to the toilets, to the school, to the community. And we believe that water changes everything. It has the ability to absolutely transform communities. So if you bring clean water into a village, you can knock out 25% of disease immediately. Water gives you the ability to talk about sanitation, about better hygiene, and get even more health benefits. Water gives people time back. And people are able to claim three, four, five, sometimes eight hours a day. And the women will tell us, you know, we use that time just to be better mothers, spend more time with our kids. Some of the women will say, you know, hey, we started a small business. We're earning 50 cents or a dollar at the market. And what I loved about it was it was just provable. It was measurable, right? Either there's clean water flowing or there's not. Either a project is continuing to function over time or it's not. And there's nobody in this room that thinks this kid should drink the water on the left. Especially if she doesn't have to. We knew water made people healthier, but a lot of data has come out recently that water really makes people wealthier. The UN put out an 88-page report saying every dollar you invest in water and sanitation Yields $12 to the local economy, and that's time savings and improved health, improved education, ability to work. They found in some communities it was as high as $22. Imagine investing a million dollars in clean water and getting a $12 million economic return. Sustainability was hard, and the, the sector's been talking about this, and you work hard to try to Train a water committee, hand over the, the project to them officially. You've got three women and three men. Charity Water is taking this a step further, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But it's important that the work is done by the locals and it is owned by the community. And in almost all situations, uh, there, there's a cost for water. Sometimes people will pay 50 cents or, or a dollar every month, and that goes into a corpus. So when maintenance is needed, You've got a committee to manage the project, and you've got money. So that it was a powerful issue, but again, what the heck was I going to do about it? 30, completely broke, living on a friend's couch. Uh, I was $30,000 in debt because nightclub promoters have no concept of saving money. Fantastic at spending money, not good at saving it. And uh, I basically given all my money to, to Mercy Ships. So I'm living on a friend's couch, and I said, you know, there's a responsibility that comes with what I've seen, and, and I've got 40 or 45 years I could throw at this. I wanted to have the biggest impact possible. And people would ask me for help, and I told them that I would help. So I thought, what if I could help end the water crisis with my life and see a day where my kids and my grandkids lived in a world that everyone had clean water to drink? Everyone had the same opportunity as me. And I had it just because of where I was born. And as I started talking to my friends about giving, I realized that there was a problem there. And they thought charity was broken. They thought giving was broken. And I said, well, what if we could also reinvent charity? What if we could also reinvent giving? And the number one problem people had was what they would refer to as the black hole of charity. I don't know where my money goes. It just goes into some big bank account and, you know, the charity's probably not very efficient. They're overpaying their CEO. You know, somebody's going to drive a Lexus around Africa with my money. You wouldn't believe the stuff I heard. And then they said, I don't really feel a connection to what my money actually did. Who did it help? And I thought we could solve this through a business model. So um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just tell the public that we will always use 100% of their money to directly fund projects? And people said, well, dude, you're crazy. Like, how will you pay for a staff and an and, and office? And how will you fly to manage water projects and go find partners and develop them? I had no idea. But I thought this was a great idea because this would at least get in the way of that problem. You just answer the same every single time. So I went and I opened up two bank accounts with 100 bucks. I said, these bank accounts will never touch each other. 
every dollar from the penny uh, from the public will be directly sent to the field. And we'll be so crazy about this, we will even pay back credit card fees. So if someone gives $1,000 and we only get $960, we'll separately raise $40 and send $1,000. The second thing was just to try to connect people to, to the work being done around the world. And for us, we were going to be funding water projects through a network of partners. So let's just prove every single one. And I walked into a, an electronics store, and I remember the GPS handheld devices cost $99. And I had like that eureka moment. Like, we can turn on this thing with two AA batteries, take a picture of it, and know where our water projects are within 10 feet anywhere in the world. So we said, we'll never fund a project unless we can be guaranteed that data. And then we'll make all of that uh, transparent from day one on Google Maps, on Google Earth. And this is also given us a way to go back and evaluate these projects over time, compare effectiveness of partners and countries. And then the third thing um, I mentioned earlier that, that I married uh, well, the third thing was really to build a brand. And I thought charities had some of the worst websites. I mean, maybe second to insurance companies at the time. And, you know, animated blinking GIFs and bad storytelling. And I wasn't sure if they just didn't have good taste or there was like a poverty mentality and, well, it can't look too good. I just thought, you know, the era of the kid in slow motion with flies landing on the face is long gone. No one I know responds to that anymore. And I thought, why, why shouldn't we try to build an epic brand that rivals a Nike or an Apple? You know, there, there wasn't that brand for me in charities. There were big charities, there were safe charities. But there wasn't a, a super creative, amazing, inspirational, epic brand. And I thought, you know, you just need a good taste and a couple talented people. So the second hire we made was a designer. And then uh, day one, the only thing I knew how to do was to throw a party in a nightclub. And that's where it all kicked off. I went back to the club. Nightclub pro promoters always can get everyone to come out on our birthday. I gave all my friends open bar. 700 people came, and I charged them 20 bucks to the door. And we took the $20 immediately to a refugee camp in Uganda. We fixed three wells, rehabbed them. We uh, drilled three new wells, and then we sent those photos and GPS back to all the people that came to the party. And they were blown away, you know? Some of them didn't even remember coming to the party. <laughs> but like they had, and they had given $20, and something actually happened. They could see it. A community of people have impacted the lives of a community halfway across the world. Started coming out with ad campaigns, and we said, you know, we don't always need to take ourselves so seriously. Let's, let's try and get people to think about water differently. And we would always effectively have a marketing budget of zero, but I thought if you could come up with clever, creative, we could get donated media. And sometimes we were funny, most of the time we were serious. But really trying to bring statistics that mean nothing to life. Again, how many of you can imagine 4,500 children doing anything, let alone dying every day? But maybe giving your kid death in a baby bottle is a more resonant image. And this turned out to be true. We got buses donated and taxis donated and, and uh, commercials donated on television. We went to Saks Fifth Avenue and we said, you guys have an amazing customer base. You sell $5,000 handbags. We have $5,000 water projects. We should totally partner together. <laughs> so for some reason, I didn't get thrown out of their office. Uh, and they loved the idea. And they wound up shooting their Mother's Day and their Father's Day catalogs completely in water. And they gave us the windows on Fifth Avenue for seven days to put up photos and spread awareness of this issue. And then they started telling their employees and their vendors and, and their customers about this. Raised $700,000 to help 140 communities. McAllen came to us afterwards and said, there's a lot of water in Scotland and there's a lot of water to make whiskey. We're like, and? <laughs> so they, they said, well, let us think about what we could do. They came back to us and they said, we found a 64-year-old McAllen. It's the oldest we've ever made. What if we took, to, took it on a world tour, and for people to taste it, they had to drop $5,000? We're like, who would pay $5,000 for 10 centiliters of whiskey? And then they sent us a $600,000 check <laughs> from a single bottle. We loved, uh, we loved social media. It was just uh, such a, a simple story uh, th th that would travel. People need clean water. Here's what that looks like. Here are the solutions, and we can show you that your money has actually made a difference. 
tried to reinvent the gala. I always hated the stuffy sit-down dinners that I got invited to, the rubber chicken, the bad PowerPoint, the you know, eight people at a table, and you're just stuck for two and a half hours. So we tried to make this fun. I mean, we were inviting people to a party where the world is getting clean drinking water. So we took over a, a space uh, not dissimilar to this in New York City called the Armory, and 2,500 people come every year, and we create experiences for them like the Water Walk. And they carry 40 or 80 pounds of water, and local businesses match every single time someone walks. Just by carrying the cans last year, you would earn 500 bucks towards a water project just by having the experience. Um, looks for non-traditional ways to get the story out. Uh, we got to open up the NASDAQ a couple times, close the New York Stock Exchange. This is as simple as just saying, hey guys, if a, if a company ever cancels, call us up. We'll be there in a couple hours notice. And then we stumbled onto this idea that Jeff and uh, others in this community have, have actually engaged with. And on our one year anniversary, I wanted to try to scale the nightclub experience, but it didn't scale. I guess I could charge 30 or 40 bucks a head. I guess I could invite, you know, a thousand people. But I just felt like I was getting too old to throw parties. And I thought, what if I asked everybody I knew to donate $32? Stay home. Like they would spend that money on a taxi and, you know, drink tip anyway. And we would have no party. I would give up gifts. I would not have a party. And I just waged an email war on everybody I know. Please donate $32. Please donate $32. If we're successful, I'll go drill a well live uh, via satellite, and you'll all be able to see it. Well, to my surprise, I raised $59,000. Like, wow, that's four times the first party, and we didn't spend any money. Almost all of it was 32 bucks at a time. And then the seven-year-old kid in Austin, Texas, starts knocking on doors asking for $7. And because he's so cute, people give him $77 and $777, and he winds up raising $22,000. And you're like, wow, this is a big idea. Everybody could care about clean water. Everybody has a birthday. People don't need more crap. You don't need ties and belts and handbags and shoes and parties. And it just started to organically take off. Justin Bieber gave up his birthday, tweeted three times, raised 47 grand. Most of his fans had to get their parents to make the donation for him. <laughs> it started to spread throughout the tech community, the founders of Spotify, founders of Twitter and Square. Started to spread through Hollywood. Will and Jada Smith gave up their birthdays and then asked their fans to donate birthdays and came with me last year at Tutu Gray to see some of the work to drill a well. Most of it, though, is not by people you've ever heard of. It's by just people like Maggie Moran, 16 years old, gave up her 16th birthday, raised 5,700 bucks. People like Nona Ween gave up her 89th birthday, wrote a beautiful mission statement. I'm turning 89, and I'd like to make that possible for more people in Africa. Nona realized she was double the life expectancy in so many of these countries where we work. Some people said, I can't wait until my birthday. I need to do something now. And they started climbing mountains, jumping out of planes, uh, giving up weddings. Let me tell you, when someone sends you a $10,000 check and says all of the money that we saved to get married, we're donating, and we're going to get married at City Hall, it's humbling. Giving up weddings, anniversaries, honeymoons, people sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, people making, uh, we've had four or five people now walk across America. This takes four months. We had a nine-year-old eat rice and beans for a month. Most of the stories, so she raised $15,000. Most of the stories were happy. They were inspiring. Uh, we had a guy uh, in our office last week that ran a half marathon with 53 pounds of water on his back. We got a guy in Afghanistan right now um, who's in the military who is writing haikus for charity water. I had to Google haiku. I forgot what it was. <laughs> Normally, the stories are really happy. Um, there's one story that happened uh, that was a tragedy but also really hopeful that um, I need to share with you guys. It's uh, the story of Rachel Beckwith. And Rachel had heard me talk uh, at her church in Seattle. Her church had raised uh, over half a million dollars for clean water uh, by throwing a keg party, actually. And she had seen me talk and gave up her ninth birthday. And she tried to raise $300 with her ninth birthday. And she fell a little short, and she only raised $220. And she told her mom that she was really bummed out. And the next year, she would do better. She would help more people next year. A couple weeks after her birthday, she was killed in a horrible car crash. It was a 20-car pileup. 
She was the only fatality as a tractor trailer smashed into the back of her car. Her mom was driving, her sister was in the front. And I was in the Central African Republic. I'd landed in New York. I got news. Um, her parents asked to open up her campaign. And her church started donating $9. It's a big community. And it quickly went to $100,000 from two twenty. dollars Started spreading throughout the wider Seattle community. Went to $300,000. Nick Kristoff got ahead of it, uh, a hold of it. ABC, CBS started spreading around the world. And people in Africa started donating $9 hearing about this little girl who had a vision for them to get clean water. I met her mom for the first time um, in New York, and mom was young and just distraught. And I remember just saying the first, first thing I said to her was, you need to spend the one-year anniversary of Rachel's death with me in Ethiopia in the communities that your daughter has helped. And she started crying, and I started crying, and she said, yes, I'll come. And that trip happened um, last year. And uh, she came with her grandparents and the pastor of her church. And uh, we just edited this together in uh, about 36 hours in the field and sent it. And I just want to share this experience with you guys. and we're about to go see some of Rachel's wells. I am Richard, I am Rachel's grandfather. I really wish Rachel could be here today. Because first of all, Rachel would think that this is probably the neatest thing she'd ever seen in her entire life. community, our church, where we are from, we greatly love Rachel and continue to love her family. And I'm overwhelmed with how greatly you have honored her memory. Uh, so please receive uh, my most deepest and heartfelt thanks. You've done us a great honor today, so thank you. Yep.
Rachel developed such a big heart from such a young age that she understood and felt the pain of others on the other side of the world. She gave up her birthday present so that other children can improve their lives is the most beautiful gift a person can give. There's a, a huge sense of responsibility that comes with a story like that and, a, and a, an incredible sense of stewardship as well uh, with over 30,000 people around the world giving to make Rachel's wish come true. What, what had really helped us illustrate at Charity Water is what had begun as our story is this scrappy startup in New York working 80 hour weeks, you know, trying to disrupt charity, trying to help everyone get clean drinking water. It didn't belong to us. This was their story. It was the story of Max and Nona and Maggie. It was the story of Rachel. It was the story of all the people around the world. And if we could actually get out of the way, maybe we could solve this problem. If we could give people simple tools, if we could focus on, on the stewardship, on the connection, maybe this problem actually could be solved by ordinary people. We spent time working on a product called Dollars to Projects, and we were intent on tying every single dollar through to, to where it went. And because 100% of the money wasn't touched, we could do this with integrity, and the life of the dollar only moved forward. So when Maggie's money was sent to the field, she could see exactly where her $5,709 went. She could see the name of the village. She could see how much that project cost. She could see where the extra money went. She could see either a plaque or a sign with her name, just to make that real to a girl who had made a great sacrifice. She could see where it was in the world, and then every single donor, if they gave a dollar or $16 or $160, got a report to see exactly where that money ended up. We took that a step farther. We crowdsourced the world's first drilling rig last year, and we got over 10,000 people to donate 100 bucks to fund a million-dollar drilling rig. And this thing went to Ethiopia, and it's going to drill for the next 15 years, about 80 wells a year. And we thought, how do we connect all these people to this rig. How do we make it real? So we wound up mounting a GPS unit on it so that it's trackable every single day and people can see where it is. And we gave it a Twitter account and every time it drills, it tweets its location. All for the cost of a couple hundred dollars of technology. We're really excited about taking this sustainability conversation a step farther. And um, last year we said, you know, we know that our projects are built, we know the money's being spent, now we want to know how they're functioning over time. And there's just no great way to do this. We spot check, we're always kind of, we're, we're constantly in the, in the communities, but with thousands of projects you can't see them all. So we went to, to Google and we said, would you guys help us develop a sensor that is specific to these pumps that could tell us every day how much water is flowing so that we know that these water committees are working. We know that the government's making repairs. They awarded us $5 million, which was the biggest uh, gift they'd ever given um, through the Global Impact Awards. And right now we're working with five different labs to develop sensors that will be able to give us that data. At the same time, we're training local mechanics all around the world, uh, almost a geek squad of sorts, who would be able to act should the community fail, should the local government fail, and keep water flowing. In the first six years, we've raised almost $100 million now. We're about to break through this milestone. For us, it's never been about the money. It's about what we're able to do with it and who's gotten involved. And over 400,000 people have gotten involved around the world, and we've been able to fund projects that will serve 3.2 million people. It's looked a little bit like a startup. 90% growth for the first five years. If you guys think that this is what the giving numbers were doing, that's not true. That's what giving looked like in America. It was net negative. And we really just believe that we can solve this problem through everyday people, through the inevitable math of, of some of these exciting networks. There's over 1,000 locals now employed on Charity Water Projects. 
We find great partners around the world, indigenous NGOs, and we fund them. We don't want to set up drilling offices in 20 countries. We go and help empower these local organizations, take them to capacity, and then help them grow. Last year we gave 700,000 people clean water, which was almost 2,000 people a day. And I'm really interested in trying to reclaim some of these statistics. Talk about the progress that's being made and not about just how many people are dying every single day. But in the end, three million is a, a drop in the bucket. If you forgive the expression. It's, uh, there are 800 million people that are still waiting. So we're focused on scale. How do we get to scale? How do we help as many people as possible? We've set a goal for ourselves of helping 100 million people get access to clean water over the next 10 years. We think maybe we make our homepage paper, if we can make that happen. And we're going to need to raise an incredible amount of money, at least $3 billion, at least $30 a person to do that maybe even more. We're going to then have to figure out how to raise another 10% to run the organization separately. But we believe that this is possible. And if you guys are asking, how is that possible? The average birthday raises $1,000. $3 billion is 3 million birthdays over 10 years. So for 300 million people in this country. And that feels pretty doable. So if you guys want to get involved uh, in our mission, um, certainly there, there are ways to get your, your company involved, your communities involved, your faith communities, um, whatever that may be. You could support water projects. You can go to our website and learn more about that. But everyone here could give up your birthday. You pledge your next birthday and not throw a party. Spread the word to your friends, your family. And um, I know that this isn't an average group of people. But if everyone did that here, we would raise $400,000 just in this room for clean water. If your birthday is a year from now, you can pledge and we'll remind you um, about a month before and give you all the tools. You can go to charitywater.org slash birthdays. Um, it's great being here. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for having me.